potential terrorist activity, you have the ultimate responsibility to protect yourself through awareness. Individual Protective Measures, IPM, will help build your defenses. If a terrorist operation is conducted against you and you become a captive, your emphasis shifts to hostage survival. With me is Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent Victor Cortez. While on assignment in Mexico, Special Agent Cortez was picked up, tortured for information, and then finally freed. He's with us today to share some insight into both IPM and hostage survival. Victor, thank you for joining us today. Perhaps we should start at the beginning. Will you tell us a little about the environment that you worked in and how you feel that you were selected as a victim? First of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here. The first thing that we went out to do is select a neighborhood. Once we did that, we selected a residence in that neighborhood. The thing that we were looking for is ways that we could either reinforce this residence or defend this re residence from the inside. High walls, wrought iron, enclosed garage, this type of things. Is and what the we neighborhood were... list came from, from the consul? Yes, sir. The uh, American consulate had uh, neighborhoods that were all right to live in. They had been pre-screened and, and selected? Yes, sir. And all of the considerations, the, the masonry and the construction and the outside had already been basically set up before you moved in? Yes, sir. And you were there four months before uh, you were actually taken hostage? Seven and a half. In the house? Right, in the house. Yes, sir. How about the, the walls themselves? 10 foot, 12 foot high walls? Yeah, about 10, 12 foot. Did you have guards? Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about them? The uh, guards were a uh, civilian, a private firm. They were very low paid uh, individuals. Did you build a rapport with them? Did they feel, did you feel they were protective toward you? We tried to treat them as uh, nice as, as we could. My wife and different occasions uh, fed them. They didn't have any lunch and my wife um, gave them food. Were they also approved? Pre-approved? Yes, yes, sir. How about the... Uh, how about your vehicles? I know that you had two vehicles. Did any of them have special equipment or contain special hardware on them? I have a personally owned vehicle and a government vehicle. The government vehicle was equipped with a radio that I, can, that I could communicate with the American consulate, but my personally owned vehicle did not have any radios. Now those are mostly kept in your garage? Yes, sir. Inside the house itself, did you have a safe haven? Yes, I did. I found the strongest um, closet with a strong door, strong hinges that I could use as a safe room. Uh, in that particular room, we placed uh, water, supply of water, food, canned food, a walkie-talkie that I could communicate with uh, other DEA agents that had been supplied with a walkie-talkie also. Were you and the wife the only ones that knew the how to communicate? No, my older boy knew. He is uh, uh, 14, 15 year, years old at that time. He's turning 15 years old. How about the neighbors? Were you friendly? Did you barbecue with them? No, sir. We were not as friendly as we would like to have been, and mainly because of the short period of time that we were there. Uh, we saw the neighbors going in and out. Um, we said hi, exchanged greetings. Uh, a lot of times when they were out sweeping the sidewalk, we went out and and uh, exchange uh, a few words. But so you, you made an effort to go out and meet your neighbors? Yes, sir. As a family living there, you probably had some routines that you developed. And I understand one of the routines that you had was your wife was became really familiar with the neighborhood. Is there any particular way that she did that? Um, the first day that we moved into the house, I took her out and showed her the neighborhood. What uh, vehicles belong there, what um, individuals belong there, the residents of that neighborhood, 
and people that didn't belong there. Um, and she became, became very good at this. Uh, we tried to vary our um, family patterns anyway as far as shopping in one particular uh, place. But when you go into a, a foreign country, there's uh, American people that want to assist you. And they usually have developed um, or found areas where you get good bargains and uh, every, everybody wants to congregate in that, those areas. We try to stay, stay away from those areas as much as possible. Sometimes we did go there, but we try to uh, vary our um, shopping places. And uh, as far as routines are, are concerned, uh, going to and from um, uh, work, I would change the um, uh, routes that I would take and the times that I would travel. Did the guards and the neighbors know who you were or what you were doing in the way of employment? They knew. I'm sure that they knew that uh, I was working at the American consulate because of the license plate that my personally owned vehicle displayed. Being a DE agent in that environment, you were really under several different types of threats. Uh, what was the greatest threat in retrospect that you, that, that you faced? Was it traffickers? Was it corrupt police? Um, both. Both. Uh, because in many instances, you don't know whether it's a police officer or a police officer that is working for the drug traffickers or traffickers posing as police officers or all the above. So you're in a case catch-22 situation. But uh, that's, that's a concern, plus the safety for the family. So it's probably tough to determine the threat in that particular situation. How about personal contingency planning? Uh, going to a hostile environment, it must be difficult for you and your wife to take into account all the contingencies. What type of planning process did you go through? There was a concern about going to this high threat area. And we discussed a lot of um, possibilities um, that there's a possibility that I could have, I could be killed in Mexico because of what happened to Enrique Camarena. Uh, it was mutually agreed and we decided to go to um, Guadalajara. However, during the time I was being tortured, I was thinking about uh, my family. Uh, are they taken care of? Will somebody take care of them? My wife was pregnant at that time, and I didn't know whether I was going to see my child, unborn child at that time. Did you have specific contingency plans? Uh, if you become missing, that she would return to the United States, uh, anything very formalized or, or written out instructions? No, I didn't. But uh, I would recommend that if... Before you go back over, would you do that again? Yes, I would. Uh, just for peace of mind, knowing that if something happens to me, everything is uh, pretty much squared away. That all she has to do is hop on a plane and be back in the United States. Very... Uh, quickly. How about paperwork, wills, powers of attorney, were those things taken care of? Most of, of that paperwork has been taken care of with me. And I didn't think much of that, again, because the, my period of captivity was very, very short. Let's talk for a minute about the actual occurrence of when you were picked up. Uh, did you have any sensitive information on you or identification that uh, you would or would not want to carry with you again? As a DEA agent conducting a surveillance, uh, most of us carry a notebook or a piece of paper and write notes. This particular time, I was carrying a notebook, making notes of addresses, phone numbers, names of individuals that we were working. And when I was picked up, this information was used against me. If I had to do it all over again, and 
I have done it in the past. This particular time, I guess complacency set in. I would write the notes and that only I could understand. A personal code? Yes, sir. Will you tell us a little bit about the moment of capture? What perhaps went through your mind when you figured that you might want to resist or you might not want to resist? Again, at the uh, original point where they picked me up, uh, that came into mind, whether should I resist or shouldn't I? But again, uh, because of the idea that you don't know whether they are police officers, corrupt police officers, traffickers posing as police officers, you're in a catch-22 situation, damn if you do and damn if you don't. So, at the absolute moment, you were in a parked car and another car came up behind you. And then they got out from that car and they identified themselves as police? Yes, sir. What happened then? I uh, identified myself to them. I didn't have any credentials when they asked me to produce my credentials. But I gave them a phone number and a, and a name to contact. Mm -hmm. And they could have easily verified that by calling over the radio, portable radio or their car radio, which I requested and they refused to. What happened at that point? Were you bound, uh, blindfolded? Not at that point. What I was doing at that point was trying to stall for time because I knew that the EA agents were coming to pick me up. And also in stalling for time, I knew that if I stalled for time, the more I stalled, the more witnesses that would witness uh, the incident. Your thought process probably at that time turned maybe to hostage survival. Yes. A lot of times very early on, there is an unconscious defense mechanism the mind uses, which is denial. No, this isn't happening to me. Did that occur to you? Yes, sir, it did. <clears throat> More so when I was being tortured. I couldn't stand the pain uh, that they were inflicting. And in one particular instant, I wanted to knock myself out by hitting myself against the, the wall to try and knock myself out to go in a deep sleep to see if, if these people would leave me alone. I guess that's a form of denial. Certainly could be. You were actually in a jail at that point, were you not? Yes, sir. Were you um, isolated, blindfolded? Did that continue? At one point, uh, I was in a cell by myself. Uh, they had already uh, searched my clothes. They had already stripped me and searched me. At this point, I found a matchbox that I picked up. The guard that was outside the door had a newspaper, and I asked to read this newspaper. The reason I was doing it, I was trying to find uh, clues to put in this matchbox. I was able to find the words State Judicial Police and the street uh, name of this particular precinct. I placed them in the uh, matchbox and placed them in my pocket, hoping that if anybody found my uh, body or my clothes that they know that I don't smoke and would be curious about this matchbox. I'm sure that if that were to happen to me, there would be tremendous fear within me. Uh, prior to the interrogation, what were your primary fears? The fear of the family. The one thing they kept asking me was where the whereabouts of my family. And I, I knew that they wanted to know where my family was so that they can use them against me, torture them if they couldn't break me. The other fear was not fear of dying, but uh, at what point would they break me and how, and when would they actually kill me? Now, probably before and certainly during uh, that captivity, you were able to establish some types of rapport. Would you tell us a little bit about that? 
I tried to establish report not only not only with the um, jail guards, the guards, but with the inmates. And I made eye contact with one of the inmates after I had been tortured and left in the cell. Minutes later, a different individual came in. I heard an individual come in. This individual took my blindfolds off and I noticed it was the same individual that I had made eye contact with. When I noticed him, I immediately told him that I needed his help, that if he could relate a message to the American consulate to tell them that there was a DEA agent in this precinct being kept against his will. Days later, I found out that this individual did in fact go to the American consulate and relate this information to my supervisor. I tried to made, build some type of report with the guard right in front of myself and I was um, getting some headway but the a senior jail guard saw this and saw that I was using this individual and took him away and told him not to uh, talk to me and furthermore to close the the window of that uh, cell. So really your rapport building efforts were rewarded? Yes, sir. About the interrogation, I would think that we have preconceived expectations of what happens when we're faced with pain and duress. Did you have expectations? Yes, I guess you can say that I would uh, have loved to be that would, a John Wayne type of individual when faced with a situation as this. But in reality, it's impossible. Uh, it's not how macho you are, but how strong-minded you are. In this case, it's not the body that they want, but your mind. And if they have your mind, the rest of you follows. Your mind is what they want. Let's talk about release for a minute. Will you tell us the circumstances that surrounded the release process? When they picked me up in front of the bowling alley, I stalled for time. Witness um, saw this individual pick me up. They were able to um, um, identify the three prefix of the plates of the certain vehicle, which um, was traced to the state uh, offices. And uh, my uh, supervisor began calling uh, people up higher up in the uh, Mexican government, and this individual in turn started calling the uh, state offices. They co called this particular one where they had me, and they denied that I was there. But after so many calls, they finally realized that somebody knew that I was there, and they finally uh, called the American consulate and told my supervisor that I was in fact being held there. When they were able to obtain your release, how long were you, did you remain in that area? Um, the very next day I was uh, in a plane heading for the, heading for Arizona. To you, your wife, and, and your son? The family, yes. When did you first meet the press? Approximately three days later. What happened? My first uh, instinct was to tell uh, everything they had done to me, but then I stopped and thought about it and uh, realized that there's still some agents back in Mexico that I could have endangered their lives. And so I waited and I just uh, gave the bare minimum. And it was not until much later that I gave a, a full account of my incident on the program 2020. Did you have a media spokesperson with you when you made the, that first statement? Yes, sir. Did it help? Yes, sir. Let me ask you one last question before we let you go. 
If you were to give some advice to someone who was going to a high threat area, what would it be? Two things come to mind. The threat is real and being able to survive. The threat is real as an American going to a foreign country on an official capacity, we must attempt to stay alert 24 hours a day. It is impossible to stay in this condition 24 hours, or as we say in law enforcement, condition orange. But what we can do is to recognize the areas and times when IPM should be emphasized. Remember that as Americans, we have two strikes against us, even before we get to the foreign country. We are Americans, and we work out of American consulate or American embassy. Terrorists are looking for Americans. We're walking targets. And if they're looking for Americans, the easiest place to find them is the American consulate or the American embassy. So certainly don't become complacent. How about survival? In a survival, so many times when we are faced with a violent, stressful situation, there's a temptation to lay down and give up. There is no doubt in my mind that if I would have laid down and given up, that I would have been dead. But I had faith that the agents were looking for me, and I hung on under tremendous odds that I was facing to survive. And I think that this helped me to get through. That faith certainly is will get you through duress and stress that normal circumstances would never allow. Yes, sir. Victor, thank you for joining us and sharing with us your experience and, and your insight. We certainly hope that your tour next time will be a safe one, and we hope that your tour will also be safe and successful.